My name is Adam Clausen. I currently serve as the Director of Innovation and Social Impact for an organization called Social Purpose Corrections. We're a national nonprofit that our mission is to help transform the culture in prisons all across the United States. It's amazing to be here at the ACA, which is the American Corrections Association, and the CLA, which is the Correctional Leaders Association. Both events going on right now. Incredible opportunity to connect with leaders from all across the country who ultimately determine what the system of corrections looks like on a state level, on a local level. So I'm here to connect with them, to offer our support, our services, and to really build relationships. Um, so it's pretty incredible to, to be here, to have a seat at the table in these conversations with something that I've talked about for many, many years. And to be here today, on the day that I celebrate three years, having walked out the door from a 213 year sentence after being granted immediate release, it's pretty incredible, it's pretty surreal. And I'm right back in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, where just a few blocks from here, I committed a string of robberies that landed me in federal prison with a 213 year sentence. Just a few more blocks down the street, I spent a year in federal detention. So to be back in this neighborhood almost 24 years later for a very different reason to, to model you know, what happens when you give individuals a second chance and to have those conversations with leaders from all across the country. It's been an incredible experience. Woo! Man, I was dragged out by SWAT right here. So here I am almost 24 years later and I am free for the first time in my adult life, man. Uh, if you can't tell by the look on my face, I don't even know how to express it. It's gone. Man, they tore this place down. Uh, I'm not really surprised, you know. I think part of me actually maybe feels relieved about that. I'm happy to see that it's not here. And it's like everything else from my past, you know, it's easier for me to let go of that, just move on. Like these memories are so old, they have nothing to do with who I am today or what I'm doing now. Somebody, anybody that's struggling with parole and probation, I'm gonna say this. The reason why I struggled with it so much when I was younger is because, man, I was just living dirty. I was doing all the wrong things, you know? I wanted to go out every night, I wanted to party, I wanted to drink. Um, man, that made my life very complicated. And when you're living inside, you know, the, the boundaries, when you're doing all the right things, hanging around good people that genuinely want to see you win, good things are going to happen to you. And I promise you, parole, probation, whatever you're doing, it's not even going to be a consideration. And I say that from experience because me wrapping up my parole and probation has actually been pretty, pretty easy. Those people who are the most influential, I would say first and foremost is my wife. She hung with me throughout the years, always believed in me, uh, supported me in becoming the person that I am today. I wouldn't be here without her. Obviously, I had family behind me. My attorney, Sean Hopwood, you know, former federal bank robber who becomes a Georgetown law professor, was a frequent guest of the White House, helped get the law changed, became my chief advocate for years, fighting to get me out of prison. Ultimately, he won, won that opportunity. He went in there and advocated for me, got me immediate relief. Uh, some of the other people on the inside, Susan Folk, who brought in our life coach training program. She created the means for me to become the person I was meant to be, but for me to then also develop the skills that I needed to help other people transform their lives. Dr. Tony Gaskew, man, he, he helped me realize that I was smart. He gave me the opportunity to become a teacher, to become an educator. I'm forever grateful to all those people and to all of the others, you know, who supported me directly, indirectly. The list is long. Marshall Piccinini, uh, Robert Reed. Uh, man, I'm sure I'm leaving people out, but I wouldn't be here today without a whole lot of people stepping up and giving me the love and support 
uh, that I needed for many, many years to ultimately win my release and to be here back in Philadelphia again today. Well, the younger me, prior to my incarceration, uh, would have been out running these streets, probably on some nights would have ended up just about a block over at Love Park, you know, 3 a.m. in the fountain, just acting crazy as a kid. Other nights it was, you know, taking a trip to the top of the art museum stairs. I've ridden it both up and down on a motorcycle. My nights out in the city back then were very, very different. Memories of the past good old days. I would say there, are, there aren't any real good memories from that era. There's no nostalgia here for me. When I look around, I see a very different city. It's almost 24 years later. To me, now, like, I'm interested in it, seeing what the new restaurants are, getting a good meal. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't party in that way. Like, when I celebrate, my celebrations are like, it's gonna be me running those rocky stairs, you know what I mean, jumping up and down at the top of them. Like, that's my celebration, man. The day that I was brought here, I was actually transferred in. They brought me in halfway down the block in a van, cuffed, shackled. They actually bring in through the basement. Went through a process of what's called booking and receiving. Take your fingerprints, ask you a whole bunch of questions. All of that's pretty much a blur. I do remember sitting in the holding cells because once you're incarcerated, man, nobody's in a hurry. Right? They'll leave you sit in a cell for hours, for days. I sat in that cell waiting to get processed and by the time I finally got a bedroll, they told me I was going up to a unit. Like I was relieved, it almost felt like I was, I was being freed to a certain degree. And uh, I got up there to the unit and I was one of the first people on that unit, five south. So they opened the doors and they said, Go ahead, pick a cell, wherever you want to go. I walked in, I picked my cell, and was happy just to lay my head down on a, on a cold, hard bunk and finally get a good night's rest. To be standing here in front of this building 24 years later, I mean, it's, it's pretty surreal. I remember looking out that window right up there. The day that I got sentenced to 213 years, looking out, wondering, if I was ever going to be back here to see this city again. You know, I didn't, I didn't know at that point. And I didn't have complete faith, not at that point, you know, that I was going to get relief. I had some doubts, at least, at least for a minute or two, right? So I got my confidence back. The worst thing that happened in this building is that they tortured us. Um, I mean, like, Came in in the middle of the night, pulled us out of the cell numerous times, cuffed, shackled, thrown out on the cold, wrecked deck, while they shook down our cells. Um, it felt like, for the majority of that year, everyone was out to get us. And when we finally went to court and got a witness list and found out that, yeah, a lot of people on that unit were actually trying to testify against us, just make stuff up to to benefit themselves, to get some kind of time reduction. Um, they planted people on the unit. The case manager was always asking us if we wanted to talk to the U.S. Attorney's Office, make a deal. It was nuts, man. It was the most stressful year of my life. So it wasn't just one incident. My whole experience here was absolutely miserable. My one co-defendant who to this day is one of my closest, dearest friends, Admittedly made a lot of mistakes, but this experience and us deciding to go to trial together formed a bond that I can't explain. Fortunately, he did not receive a life sentence. For whatever reason, the jury looked at him, saw his young face, and decided to cut him a break. He ended up with 10 years. He ended up with 10 years despite the fact that he too was facing life. So here we are standing in front of FDC Philly, talking about second chances, and curious to know, what do second chances mean to you? Second chances to me, regarding our situation specifically, but I think other people can take what they want from this, is getting 
living our second lease on life. Like I felt like for so many years that I tried to do something constructive with my life as your significant other, as a prison wife, and to do enough good that it could undo or maybe make up for, because you can't really undo your past, but that it could make up for the wrongs of both of our past to finally get our second chance and move forward, to get our second lease on life and be able to help people using the experiences that we had in our past. The purpose of the conference, it's the American Corrections Association and the Correctional Leaders Association. Both of these conferences are, are here meeting with correctional leaders from all across the nation. I'm here representing my organization, Social Purpose Corrections, as the Director of Innovation and Social Impact. Our goal is to uh, be here as a support to all those correctional systems as far as providing improved access to wellness programs for both staff and for residents. There's a multitude of ways that we get to do that. For me, just being at this conference is an amazing opportunity to meet with leaders from all over the country, to literally have a seat at the table. Uh, it's a table that for years, while I was on the inside, I joked about, not joked, I was serious serious about getting that seat at the table and now to be here to be present with all of these leaders um, to get to know them on a personal level has been really really amazing.